All right, welcome to Western Civilization. Today we're looking at the Thirty Years' War, which conveniently for everyone lasts 30 years. That really helps out. From 1618 to 1648, exactly 30 years. So the Thirty Years' War, unlike the Hundred Years' War, which was off by a bit, this is the Thirty Years' War. Now, uh, what time period are we talking about? Uh, the 1600s. We have uh, the 1500s was the dec the century of religious wars. By the 1600s, we're going to start trying to solve or finish up with those religious wars. Well, let's the, the place we're talking about here for this Thirty Years' War is the German states. There is no Germany yet. They're German states. And they're under the control, most of them, and here in Central Europe, are under the control of the Holy Roman Empire. And I'll be abbreviating that as HRE, the Holy Roman Empire. And it's got a lot of problems. Um, you know, it's kind of the source of jokes. It's neither holy nor Roman nor much of an empire. Well, it's really not. Um, as far as the emperor goes, the emperor is elected. And it just turns out that they've been electing the Habsburg family for, for centuries now. And so that's kind of just who expects to get it. It's not the most powerful, influential family, but they kind of expect being the emperor. And then into this, we throw this religious trouble. Going back to the 1500s, you know, they were killing each other for a while after 1517. And by 1555, they uh, kind of came to a peace. So this is where we're going to pick up here, 1555. The Peace of Augsburg, after some killing between Lutherans and Catholics, they've decided on quius regio, eius religio, the ruler of an individual state, and there are hundreds of them, will decide the religion for those people. And you end up being Germany, the German states, about half Lutheran and half Catholic. Lutherans to the north, Catholics to the south. And then by 1600, something's changed. Now this is about 50 years into the future, from 1555 to 1600, about 50 years Ahead, some new changes have taken place. There are some new elements involved in this religious warfare. For instance, the Calvinist, uh, John Calvin out of Switzerland and his, uh, his Presbyterian church, his Reformed church, much more aggressive as far as spreading Protestant ideas. The Lutheran thing had been Lutheran. Well, here come the Calvinists into the Lutheran German states, much more aggressively spreading the idea that you know, this is uh, the work of God. It's your, your fate is to, to spread this religion if you're a truly a Christian. And then against them come the Jesuits. In the 1500s, the Catholics had responded to Protestantism with kind of a shock troop of Catholic priests. They're called Jesuits, specially trained to combat Protestantism, the spread of Protestantism. So what happened by 1555 was kind of a, a push, half and half. By 1600, people are getting much more aggressive now with their religious beliefs. And what you end up with is a Cold War. Now, the most famous Cold War is going to occur in the 20th century between us and the Soviet Union. It never explodes into a war. This one's actually going to explode into a war. The Cold War picks up around 1600. Um, a big event in 1607 was a succession of states. You know, if, uh, if the ruler of a state gets to decide the religion, well, what if the state can change to a different family or a different successor? So there were a couple of uh, really important German states, Cleves, Berg, and Mark, that had been changed hands in 1607. And uh, many people claim this was illegal, that they'd switched families and switched religion. And this causes uh, the other German states to go into just armed, uh, the threat of, you know, that this could try to snuff out your religion. And so they become two armed camps of Catholics against Lutherans. In 1608, the Protestants will get rolling first with a Protestant union. Their leading states are the Palatinate, one of the electors of the Holy Roman Empire is the elector of Palatinate. That's along the Rhine. And then the elector of Brandenburg. Now, this is uh, centered around Berlin. So the elector of Brandenburg and the elector of Palatinate getting the Protestant states together. And the Catholics respond with a Catholic League. And again, we're going to start arming and building armies here because they think that, uh, you know, a war might be coming. And the Catholics are led by Bavaria. The Duke of Bavaria will be their leader. So this is uh, about 1607, 1608, 1609. Everyone's kind of moving toward war. Well, into this situation comes a weak Holy Roman Emperor. At the time, his name was Rudolf II, and he's not having children. Um, he spends a lot of time with artists and such, and uh, if you get a chance to go to Vienna or Prague, you might see some of the artwork done during his reign. There's actually a portrait of him done with fruit. 
He'll have one done for every season. And once he is going to pass away, and you know everyone knows he will pass away eventually, it should pass to his brother, who's much more Catholic. Well, where does Rudolph stand on religion? Well, Rudolph uh, doesn't like this religious war that's going on, religious fighting that's going on, and he had moved to Bohemia. Now, you need to know where Bohemia is. Today it is called the Czech Republic. It's an independent republic today with its capital city, Prague. Back then it was part of the Holy Roman Empire. It was an important state of the Holy Roman Empire. It's, a, it's not a German state, it's a Czech state, a Slavic state. Their tradition is one of rebellion. In fact, the word Bohemian kind of means today one who doesn't go by the norms. Uh, this goes back to the 1500s, uh, actually the 1400s. Jan Hus, uh, one of the early reformers against Catholicism, had been burned to the stake, and they'll kind of continue this idea of opposing central authority. Again, the word Bohemian still used today. So uh, Rudolph II, while he's up in Prague with his artist, uh, staying at, trying to stay out of the religious fighting, um, he had actually given the Czechs, he liked the, the people of Prague and the Czechs, he had given them what are called letters of majesty. These are letters from him guaranteeing their ability to uh, stay uh, Lutheran or whatever their religion they want. Who, Jan Hus, the ideas of Jan Hus. And uh, he had even appointed some of them to be defensors, men who were responsible for enforcing religious toleration. Well, he's, as he passes on around 1618, um, what about those guarantees? What about those guarantees? You know, they're in his name, but what about the next Holy Roman Emperor? What's going to happen to their independence? What's going to happen to their Protestant standing if the emperor changes hands or an emperor with a different philosophy comes in? Well, that's what it is. It's what going to set this war off. The spark that sets this war off is the death of Rudolph. And what about these religious toleration? Because the next emperor, Matthias, is going to be more aggressively Catholic. And they know that. Well, to become Holy Roman Emperor, you have to be elected. That makes, for usually for a weak emperor, you have to go around and curry your votes. Well, for him, one of his votes is, will be his own. The crown of Bohemia has been in the Habsburg hands. Rudolph held the crown, and now he wants that crown and um, as one of the electors. So there are seven electors. You need four votes. So this one vote is pretty important. It should be his own vote. And they don't give him the crown. Rudolph is dead and they don't immediately contact Matthias and tell him the crown of Bohemia is yours. Well, that's an act of rebellion to oppose the, em the, the future emperor. Well, the emperor sends his representatives to Prague to demand the crown, and the nobles of Bohemia, very much independent and very much trying to defend their religion, their Protestantism, will throw those representatives out of a window from the castle in Prague. This is the famous event called the defenestration of Prague. You'll probably never see this word again. Defenestration means to throw something out of a window. Again, if you look at the French word fenêtre or the German word finster, you'll see that fenêtre, finster, defenestration out of a window. And according to the stories, it was a pretty high window, I mean, maybe, maybe four or five stories up, and they were expected to die. So, uh, <coughs> you know, so it's a pretty big event, and they survived. You know, um, for the Catholics, this was a miracle that they survived. And for the Protestants, you know, they've humiliated, <laughs> they've humiliated the emperor. But this act of rebellion is the spark that sets off the Thirty Years' War. So the Thirty Years' War from 1618 with the defenestration of Prague, that is considered an act of war by Matthias, and it will last until 1648, conveniently 30 years. We break it into four phases, so a 30 years war into four phases. Well, here comes phase one. This is the Bohemian phase, and then it's going to spill into German, so we call it the Bohemian-German phase. Here we go. With these rebellious Czech nobles, they've thrown the emperor's ministers out of a, out of a window. The Battle of White Mountain takes place. Now, White Mountain is outside of Prague. Prague had walls around it, and White Mountain was outside. Today, it's actually a suburb of Prague. Um, I tried to find it one day, and it's, it's a subway stop there. So it's a, it's a neighborhood today, but it was once outside the city walls. So the Catholic army comes up, and if you'll notice, it took them a couple of years. Nothing happens really fast in the 1600s, so it takes a couple of years for the armies to come up from Vienna to gather the Catholic armies and make it to Prague. So the Battle of uh, White Mountain is fought in 1620. And uh, just to look at warfare in the 1600s, um, it's kind of a mixture of muskets and pikes. Muskets are the, an effective weapon. You know, a lot of pop by shooting out this metal ball. Um, but they take a long time to load, and so you need 
to have these pikemen around you while you're loading. So what you'll end up with is these square formations of musketeers and pikes in a square. They don't move very fast, but again, the pikes provide the protection to the musketeers. So the Battle of White Mountain in 1620, the Catholic army comes up to Protestant uh, Prague, and they win. They smash the Protestant army. The Czechs are routed. And um, this victory is really important. This is the end of Czech rule. All the way through to World War I, the Czechs will not have self-rule. And then what about the Protestantism? What about the letters of majesties in the defensors? Well, they will be put down. And now, after 1620, you will have German nobles, the victors at White Mountain, will now start taking over parts of the Czech Republic or the Czech areas and ruling over these Slavic Czechs. And of course, they will enforce Catholicism because the Protestants have lost the Battle of White Mountain. Well, into this, now that uh, you've you know, punished the Protestants, well, maybe this could be something bigger. In fact, Spain, when Spain hears about this, again, Spain is the Catholic um, crusading state, they start to get involved now that, hey, the Germans are in rebellion, an army, a Catholic army has smashed the Protestants. Let's just continue this. Let's continue this into the German states and just smash the Lutherans completely. So Spain gets involved sending advisors and money for this war. And this is the initial phase, and it's quite good for the Catholics. Here's the Catholic army coming up toward Prague and winning their victory. Another Catholic army will come from the Spanish states down the Rhine River into the Palatinate here. Again, the Palatinate is a powerful Protestant state. So the war continues into the German states, and the Catholics win easily, easily victory, rolling up one Lutheran state after another, smashing Protestant armies. And then for a while here, it looks like the end of Lutheranism. This could be the end as these states are rolled back one after another. These Lutheran states losing their armies and being uh, conquered by Catholic armies. Well, into this, I want to mention France. Now, France is not a German state, uh, but France is a powerful kingdom now under a man named Cardinal Richelieu. They have a king, Louis XIII, but his first minister is Cardinal Richelieu. We'll talk more about him later. And Le Richelieu's idea for France, how to run France, is what is called realpolitik. You know, you could sit here and have a religious war, or you could simply do what's best for France. Realpolitik means what is best for the country, in his idea, what is best for France. Well, is a powerful Holy Roman Empire best for France? A Holy, Emperor, a Holy Roman Emperor with no religious problems, with Spanish power behind him, that's going to be bad for France. And you're going to see this later on when the Germans do finally unite in the 1800s. It's going to be bad for France. So he knew that a long time ago. So he starts to send money to the Protestants, try to empower their armies. They need money to put armies together. So um, he'll start trying to fund German states, he'll start funding other Lutheran states, for instance, Denmark. Denmark is not a German state, but it sticks up from uh, the German states. And then further north, Sweden. These are two powerful Lutheran states to get them involved in this war, the Danish army and the Swedish army. So actually, it's um, going to be kind of successful. The Danes, uh, with his money, will in, and move into the German states to try to defend Lutheranism. And the Danish phase goes on for about five years, 1624 to 1629, and they're going to eventually get crushed. The Danes will get crushed. So it, it, was a, it was a case of too little, too late, the Danes stepping in too late because two Catholic armies were on the move, two massive Catholic armies just rolling up victory after victory, and two powerful Catholic generals, Count Tilly leading one Catholic army and the other Catholic army led by Albrecht von Wallenstein, or Wallenstein, a uh, Czech, uh, a Catholic Czech. So Catholic victories rolling up one after another. Wallenstein's kind of interesting. Wallenstein, kind of a self-made man. We'll come back to him and talk about him throughout this. Uh, he was a Czech and a businessman. And when the emperor called on him to serve, he came and served and spent his own money building and training his own army under his command. And he's quite successful kind of running an army like a business instead of just a random act of soldiers. Well, as you're, they're destroying the Danish armies, they're conquering German states, and the Dr Danes are driven back to Denmark, um, the Holy Roman Emperor begins to make some mistakes. First mistake, because as you're trying to bring the Germans under control, 
um, he falls under an ultra-Catholic party. Now, the Catholics who kind of started this war in defense of Catholicism, but now he falls under ultra-Catholics who will take no toleration of Protestantism whatsoever. And among them are Spanish. The Spanish will be sending advisors and generals and funds and influencing this war. And they don't care much about the Germans at all. They just want to see Lutheranism snuffed out. And then the next thing he does is mistake he makes is he fires Wallenstein. This very successful general had become too powerful in the emperor's mind. His army was kind of, uh, you know, could possibly march in Vienna. You know, and then someone convinced him that Wallenstein might be the next Holy Roman Emperor. And so the emperor will fire Wallenstein. And Wallenstein goes home. He says, thank you. And uh, the emperor thanks him for the service. And he goes home back to, back to uh, Bohemia. And then the third thing, the most powerful thing the emperor does wrong is he issues an Edict of Restitution in 1629. What an Edict of Restitution is, he's going back to 1517, when the Lutherans first rose up and started converting churches and church property to Lutheranism, and the Catholics just lost out. This Edict of Restitution would turn the clock back 100 years, restoring all this property of Lutheran states to the Catholic Church. Now that's going to get people up in arms. You know, you're talking about, it's one thing to talk about religion and your church might have to go underground, but now all the property that you've amassed for the last hundred years will go back to the Catholic Church. And that really starts firing up a lot of Lutherans that might have been sitting on the fence and not too worried about warfare, might start getting an army together. So um, into this will come the, the Swedish army. The Danes have been crushed and now here comes Sweden. This is the uh, third phase, the Swedish phase of the war. So here comes Sweden. Under their young king, they have a young king named Gustavus Adolphus, the young king of Sweden. He uh, had taken over early and young as a young king and had uh, been interested in warfare. He had actually been to Holland when the Dutch were fighting against the Spanish and watched how the Dutch fought. You know, Spain was the power and the Dutch were in rebellion, so he watched how the Dutch fought the big Spanish armies. And what he recognized is you've got to have a professional army. You've got to have, you can't just call up levies and have them serve for a few months and then go home. You need a professional strike force army. And he had a chance to uh, practice with his. He fought a war against the Poles, so his army is seasoned. And it's going to be fired up with a religious fervor. Again, they're going to be looking at them as the savior of the Lutheran church. The Lutheran church is about to be snuffed out. And they will come, the Swedes will come in as the savior of Lutheranism. And he's got a lot of money. Cardinal Richelieu will be funding Sweden heavily here, so it doesn't wreck his own country to do this. Again, where we're talking about Sweden, we're looking at the, uh, the Scandinavian states. This is Norway, Sweden, and Finland. The Swedish state hangs here past Denmark and then almost touches Germany here. The German states, Berlin will be down here. So here come the Swedes landing into the German states. The area they land in right here is called Pomerania. So let's talk about his army for a second. It's just kind of interesting to look at what Gustavus Adolphus has done as far as his army goes. His army is what we call the first modern army. If you pick up a book on military history, you're going to come across his army as the first modern army using mostly gunpowder, getting rid of all the old edge weapons or a lot of the edge weapons. So looking at his army, looking at the infantry of his army, um, he still has some pikemen, but mostly musketeers. His army will be predominantly musketeers. In other words, with the French money, he can afford a lot more muskets and get a lot more firepower on the enemy. And then you have to have some pikemen here because it takes a while to load these muskets. But fewer pikemen, just one line of pikemen is all you're going to need. Now, these will be professional soldiers. They need lots of training, 12 months. They don't go home. They're professionals. So they're going to be paid that way. And uh, in the training, you're going to need NCOs. These are going to be sergeants. These are not officers, but enlisted men who are paid well to train the other enlisted men. And again, enlisted men, enlisted men trust these NCOs more than you would some uh, nobleman telling you to go march forward. So this is a, a revolution, a modern army. And his revolution in tactics is that instead of a big mass, square mass of pikemen and musketeers, he will have one line of pikes, and then the musketeers will be on the wings and they'll fire and then step back behind the pikes. You can see them stepping back behind the pikemen, reloading, and then swinging back out again to fire. There's a lot more firepower for the Swedish army. They don't have to duck back into the pikes, you just swing to the outside of the pikes. 
And then for his cavalry, cavalry still an important arm, cavalry at this time was mostly noblemen, men who grew up on horseback and can afford the, the horses and the, the saddles and all the stuff. Well, the old way of fighting on horseback was that you kind of fought on the sides, the flanks. Noblemen wanted to fight noblemen, not a pikeman, you know, get killed by a musketeer. So um, what he's going to change with his cavalry, use them for shock. They're going to ride, fight the enemy cavalry, and then ride into the infantry, actually as a shock weapon, into the infantry. Well, what do you need if you're going to try to pierce the infantry? Well, you're going to need a pistol. Pistols are expensive. And so he will fund his soldiers with pistol, maybe even two of them. And they're wheel lock pistols. You know, the old in the 1600s here, the firing mechanism, mechanism used a lit fuse. You had to touch this lit fuse to the, uh, to the gunpowder. Well, you know, it can be dangerous to have a lit fuse around. Well, this is a wheel lock. You wind this thing up like a toy, today like a toy, and when you pull the trigger, it will spin and make a spark. So you'll use a mechanism to make a spark, which will ignite the gunpowder. Very expensive weapons these are. And then once you shoot your pistols into the uh, enemy's infantry, you don't stop there. You will then ride into them with your horse's feet up and crushing infantry and swinging a heavy saber, not a light dandy saber for slashing, but a heavy saber for crushing into infantry. And then for artillery, he wants something mobile, mobile artillery, not these giant cannons. In the 1600s, they had just massively huge cannons that required teams of oxen to pull and they weren't mobile on a battlefield. You would set them up before a battle and they're not going anywhere. Well, these will be mobile cannon for Gustavus Adolphus. Firing a small ball, a three-pound ball. We call these three-pound cannons. Obviously, the cannons weighs more than that, but the ball weighs three pounds. About the size of a tennis ball, maybe. And a tennis ball skidding across the ground, you might not think it could be very effective, but again, we're talking about infantry massed in these big blocks. And so a tennis ball can crush about 30 or 40 people when it rolls through these blocks of people. It, again, the ball's not going to stop. It's got momentum. It's, it's three pounds. It carries a lot of momentum with it. Uh, they're cast bronze cannons, so they're, they're smaller and lighter than the old style. He called this rolling thunder. When these cannons go on the battlefield, you'll have these infantry units moving quickly on the battlefield, these artillery pieces rolling along with the infantry, and then these art in the cavalry attacking the infantry. It's going to see it. It's going to be a masterpiece when it goes into action. The Swedish army is quite formidable in the 1600s. Gustavus Adolphus, with his army together, lands in Pomerania in the year 1630. Again, this is the Swedish phase. And his army is going to march from Pomerania down toward the Catholics. Again, the Catholic armies are roaming around, snuffing out Protestant state after Protestant state. One of the Catholic armies was attacking the, the city of Magdeburg. This was a city of, of Brandenburg, the state of Brandenburg, the leader of the Protestants. And uh, Gustavus Adolphus doesn't get there in time. The Catholics will actually capture Magdeburg and then massacre the civilians. It's quite legendary, the massacre at Magdeburg. Again, this will fire the Protestants up, that they've you know, got to defend themselves. Well, here comes Gustavus Adolphus with some German allies. He takes on that army of Tilly at the Battle of Breitenfeld. Gustavus Adolphus against Tilly, one of the leading Catholic commanders. Gustavus Adolphus versus Tilly. And here's what a battle looked like with Gustavus Adolphus' new modern army. Here's the Catholics. These little dots represent those tercios, those square units, thousands of men per square. And then the Protestants under Gustavus Adolphus, his army comes on, and they get some German allies over here. Uh, as the battle, as the two armies hit, the Germans are easily wiped out. You've got a cavalry battle over here. And then the Protestant, the Catholic army begins.